Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. I just want to get into a few announcements before we get started. Firstly, giving and prayer meeting will be online. Prayer meeting on Zoom, the details will be in the description. Um, also, just a few other announcements. Youth will be on Zoom this week, Friday. Also, if you guys aren't part of a home group, I know that this is a really tricky time for people, but I'll strongly encourage you to stay connected, be messaging people, join a home group. There's some incentives to joining the right home group. Hannah and Clint's one is pretty good. You could find yourself getting a free coffee. Um, <laughs> We're just going to be heading into a time of worship. I'd really strongly encourage you guys, even though we're not in church, just press in on God, be intimate with God and be intentional about this time. Just open your heart to receiving from God and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you. After that, we'll be praying for the nation of Cambodia. So join us in prayer.
victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes
I'm like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Almighty God, we pray for the nation of Cambodia. Father, we lift up this country, one of the poorest and least developed in all of Asia, and we pray that they would find their wealth in you. Father, we pray against the corruption that is so prevalent in the government, and we pray that you would raise up leaders who would stand with integrity and rise up against corruption. We pray that your word of truth would reign in this nation. Father, we pray for the poor and the oppressed, we know that you are the defender of the weak, and we pray that you would rise up in your power to provide justice for those who you love. Lord, we know that violent crime is so prevalent. The robberies and the muggings and the kidnappings, Lord, we know that human trafficking is far too common. And we pray for the children, the men and women who are trafficked and sold into bondage around the world. We pray against the child prostitution. Lord, we know that you love the little ones and we pray that you would bring them into freedom. We pray that your church would rise up with this problem of loving the orphans, Father, and we pray that you would rescue them from the slavery that they're in, that you would heal them and bring them peace and redemption. We pray for the king of Cambodia. We pray that you would guide him as he leads that nation and we pray that he would seek you. And we pray for your church. We pray that you would bring pastors. Lord, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Raise up workers to go out into all the rural areas of Cambodia. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would sweep across that nation in a fresh wind and light the people of Cambodia on fire with your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Okay, let's come and pray for the nation of Cambodia. Father, we come to you in Jesus' mighty name and we want to bring before you the nation of Cambodia. Lord, we ask that your blessing would be upon this nation. Lord, that uh, you would reign over this nation. Lord, that you would strengthen your church, that you would cause them to rise up. Lord, that your gospel would go forth and that, Lord, that your anointing and your blessing would be upon them as a whole. Oh Lord, that uh, you would bless their government. Lord, that you'll give them wisdom, that you'll give them understanding, you, that you would give them strategies, Lord, particularly in this day that we uh, live in and the challenges that we face. Lord, they need your wisdom. So, Father, we pray in the precious and mighty name of Jesus that uh, there would just be uh, an outpouring of your grace and your understanding upon that nation. Lord, uh, be glorified, we pray, in Cambodia. Lord, we, we pray for the church that we are, we are supporting there as well. Lord, we lift them up. We thank you, mighty God, that you are supporting them, that you undergird them, and that, Holy Spirit, you empower them. Lord, may they feel and experience your grace and your power in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be with you again this morning. Great to be able to uh, be able to come to you, I guess, this morning after things get changed around so quickly and move up and may move down. We don't know from one day to the next, but aren't we glad that we actually stand on a solid rock, that our feet are firmly planted and that we don't have to uh, grapple around looking for that foundation. We've got it in Christ Jesus. This morning, uh, I just want to pray before we get started and uh, let's come and do that now. Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to share your word this morning. Lord, I ask in Jesus' precious and mighty name that you would highlight the things that, that are on your heart, Lord, the things that you want to bring to the fore. 
Father, I just ask right now that uh, your blessing and anointing would be upon your people, that you would give them ears to hear that which it is that you are really wanting to speak and to bring across this morning in Jesus' precious and mighty name. Back in April earlier this year, I spoke on faith and trust and the fact that they were inseparable. They were something of a dynamic duo. And another dynamic duo is righteousness and justice. You can't have one without the other. They're inseparable. It's impossible to have righteousness without justice and you cannot have true justice without righteousness. So what is righteousness? Righteousness is the character or the quality of being just or right. In, in Middle English, it came from two different words, the word uh, right and wiseness, so that we get the idea of the right wiseness of God. Righteousness is a core attribute of God's being. What God says and does comes from his very character, and that is the attributes that we recognise from the scripture that compromise who God is. In other words, God's thoughts, words, actions, motives, desires, his attitudes, they all come from who he is as revealed in the Bible. You know, Clint's been doing a fantastic job of actually preaching on and, and teaching on the, the attributes of God. And I encourage you to actually listen to some of his messages because they give a really good foundation on the characteristics and the qualities of who God is. And while I'm not speaking on righteousness this morning, I felt that it was really important to link the right and wise ways of God with the, the things that he says and the things that he does, the patterns that he gives to us and the things that he institutes for us, the institutions that he sets forth for us to follow in the scripture. My topic this morning is actually on headship and specifically headship within marriage and in the context of the church. Now, the subject of headship, I know, can be a little bit emotive. It can be a little bit prickly. So before I begin, I want to throw in a few disclaimers there. Firstly, wives, this morning, if you think that I'm about to fix up uh, all of your, your husband's issues to sort him out, uh, he will probably still want leave the toilet seat up and he's probably still going to lounge around on the couch quite a fair bit and watch sport. That's not going to change. And husbands, this morning, don't be thinking that I'm about to tell the, your wife her place or sort out her issues either. She's still going to complain about you watching too much sport and leaving the toilet seat up. So that's not going to change either. Uh, you know, you, you may not be married this morning and that's, that's okay because the principles that I'm going to speak on actually apply to our lives right through. Yes, particularly in marriage, but the whole concept of headship will come across through this, I hope, in Jesus' mighty name. And the, the other thing that, that I really want to say here too is that I'm not a model husband. I don't hold myself up to be that. Uh, I'm a work in progress as well. And the last thing that I want to throw in as a disclaimer here, but is a really important thing, and I say it in all seriousness, is the fact that strong women leaders are okay. Okay, strong women leaders are okay. We have many strong women leaders within uh, our church in all sorts of areas and vocations and ministries, both inside and outside of the church. And that is a really good thing. There are various contexts in which leadership operates. And what I want to stress to you this morning is that leadership and headship are not the same thing. Leadership is definitely an attribute of headship, but leadership and headship are not the same thing. So what is headship? Well, I've done a lot of reading of various different books. I've been looking for definitions. I've read a number of articles as well, and I just haven't really found something that I felt was concise and to the point. And so I want to give you my definition of headship this morning. Headship is a principle of operation which is instituted by God for the purposes of meeting responsibility by the delegation of his authority. Let me say that again. Headship is a principle of operation that's instituted by God for the purposes of meeting responsibility by the delegation of his authority. 
Headship is a godly, right and wise way of doing things which brings about a blessing, it brings about benefit, it brings about welfare and it brings about well-being. So let's start at the beginning as we go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 to 28. Verse 26, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock and all the animals on earth, and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So in verses 26 and 27, God has made human beings in his image to be like them, or as the scripture reads, to be like us. We see in these verses both the singular and the plural pronouns that are used. He, his, our, and us. That is because the scripture says that the Lord our God is one Lord, yet there are three persons who are ascribed the title of Lord and the attributes of deity within the scripture, and that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all co-equal, co-powerful, and co-eternal, yet with distinct responsibilities and functions. For example, the Father has greater authority than the Son or the Holy Spirit. He has a role in leadership that the, the Son and the Spirit don't have, and Jesus highlighted that in John chapter 5, verse 36, in John 10, 29, and also in John chapter 14, verse 28. As the Father is the leader, he is also the initiator. The Father sent the Son into the world to redeem humanity. Jesus came, he took on flesh, he lived amongst us, he died, he rose again, ascended into heaven, and then the Father sent the Holy Spirit to empower the church. Yet I want to stress to you that all three are equal, but each has a different function and responsibility. So here we see headship in operation, and that is the operation for the purposes of meeting responsibility by the delegation of authority. God operates in headship. We call this the Godhead or the Trinity. And you will not find the words headship or trinity in the Bible, so before you come and sort of say, well, hang on a minute, that's not in there. You're right, it's not. Even the word Godhead doesn't appear in most versions of the Bible. But these, these are terms that we give to various attributes of God and to biblical truths which we can recognise from the Scripture. You will find the word head used, however, and you'll find it used metaphorically, referring to one per person being in authority over another. For example, in Ephesians 5.23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, the Greek word for head is sometimes metaphorically used to mean so source or life source as in Christ being the head over the church, you can use it in that sense because he does nourish and support and give life to the church. However, in hundreds of examples of ancient Greek literature, when it's used the word head and it's used metaphorically, it is always meaning one person having authority over another person. So my second point here is, it was Adam's fault. Nowhere in scripture does it say that Adam was deceived. I mean, he was just disobedient. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 to 18. Genesis 2, 15 to 18. Then the Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat from the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. 
So God has placed Adam in the garden to tend it and to watch over it. And it was to Adam that the warning has come. You can freely eat from any tree in the garden, but not the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you're going to die. So notice in verse 18, though, that Eve is not present yet. She's yet to be created. God has charged Adam with the responsibility to ensure that his command given to Adam is actually carried out. Adam has the duty to make sure that that command is complied with. He has been tasked with the responsibility and he has been given the authority to actually administer and accomplish that task. So going back to that, that uh, uh, definition of headship, you know, Adam has been given responsibility and then he has been given also the authority to be able to carry out that responsibility. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 19. Genesis 3, 1 to 19. I'm not going to read that out right now for the sake of time. Uh, however, I'm, I am going to refer to it this morning. I encourage you this afternoon or whenever it is that you've actually had a chance to listen to this, uh, that, that you would uh, perhaps read that and let the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you from it. This is the story of the fall, as many of us know. Uh, and in verse 1, we find uh, that Satan turns up on the scene in the guise of a serpent and he starts up a conversation and he challenges Eve. Remember, according to the scripture, Adam's actually received the command, uh, and, and, but it's Eve here that's in the centre center of the picture, and Satan has come and begun to strike up a conversation with her. And in verse 3, we see that Eve's answer to the serpent's challenge is to say, well, we can't eat from the fruit uh, of the tree in the middle of the garden. God said that if we touch it, we'll die. Now, we can only assume from the scripture that Eve has received this information secondhand from Adam. It is possible that God has told Eve this same thing at a later stage. However, I believe if that would have happened, we would have read about it in the scripture because it's a very, very important piece of information to the whole biblical account of the fall. So it's, it's a good assumption that Eve has actually received that information secondhand from Adam. In verses 4 and 5, the serpent replies, you won't die. God knows that when you eat it, your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to know, just like him, both good and evil. By the time we get to verse 6, Eve is already convinced. Okay, she, she looked at the tree and it looks pretty good. The fruit seems pretty tasty. Looks like it might be a good, good meal. So besides that, she, she really wanted the wisdom that the serpent had said that she's going to receive from eating of that fruit. So she takes a bite and she passes some over to her husband. Now Eve is deceived by the serpent and she's eaten the fruit before she's passed it over to Adam, who was just watching and listening before receiving the fruit from Eve and he also has eaten himself. Now she didn't need to go and look for him anywhere in the garden because it says that she just passed the fruit over and he took a bite. Now both of them have sinned, but I want to ask you, who does God hold accountable for that transgression. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, we read that when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. So Paul, uh, and, uh, sorry, death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Paul tells us pretty plainly that Adam actually sinned, and then sins entered the world because we all do it. It spread to all of us. Back again in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9, God addresses Adam in the garden and while Adam and Eve hid themselves because of shame, God called out to the man and said, where are you? God was calling out to Adam for an account of what has happened, of what's taken place. God already knows what's taken place. I mean, after all, he's the all-knowing God. He's aware of what's taken place, of, what, of what's, what's actually happened here. But he is holding Adam accountable and for the responsibility of keeping the, the command that was given directly to him. This point is again reinforced by God and stressed in verses 11 and in verse 17 of Genesis, 3, no, uh, of Genesis chapter 3. So God holds Adam accountable. It's a little like when you tell the children not to throw the ball in the house and they 
ignore that. <laughs> they throw the ball around. Something gets smashed. And then, you know, if, it was, if it's in our house, something happen, happens like that, I tend to call the eldest one to account first. Why is that? They've been around the longest. They've heard the rules many times over. And we tend to hold them as the most responsible. So God holds Adam responsible for dropping the ball, for disobeying what we would have called in the army a direct order. He's received it and he has not carried it out. And Adam has not fronted up to his responsibility to spiritually, physically and emotionally lead, serve and protect his wife. And you know, the very same problems happen today. As the church, that is believers and followers of Christ, we are to reflect God's glory into this world. We are saved out of darkness and into his marvellous light. We are the city that's on the hill and Jesus is the light of the world that dwells within us. And we are to let that light to shine for all people to see. When we compromise with God's word, we begin to obscure and we cover that light. And then the image and the reflection of God begins to get distorted as it, as it shines through us. My third point is sin brings conflict. There were consequences to Adam's disobedience and one of the most painful consequences is the conflict that we see in the marriage relationship. The conflict between men and women but particularly in the marriage relationship. As a result of sin, paradise is lost and the honeymoon was ended. Genesis 3.16 Then God said to the woman, I will sharpen your pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth and your desire... And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Sin brought conflict, rivalry, strife and contention between men and women. And it's really obvious in the marriage relationship. A wife will tend to want to bridle and manipulate her husband. You know, my father has told me many times over the years of how his mother used to acknowledge the fact that her husband was the head, but she was the neck that used to turn the head and that was a long time before Maria Portocarlos popularised the saying in the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. You know, there is a desire on the part of the wife to usurp authority over her husband. But he will rule over you, God continues in Genesis 3.16. If the tendencies of, wife, of the wife in the, in the marriage is to bridle and to manipulate, then men seek to oppress and to dominate. You know, they want to get the upper hand and lay down the law. Husbands often seek to shut down their wives using harsh and dictatorial authority and sometimes they act in a cruel way. The these are all the results of sin. However, in Christ, there is a reversing of the consequences of sin. Romans 5.17 Romans 5 and verse 17 says, For, sin, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Redeemed believers are empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak, to act, to think and to live in a godly way. And that's why we're, we read in Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. And there are similar references in, uh, in Titus 2, chapter 5, uh, sorry, Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, and also in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. Ephesians 5, 22 to 25. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave his life up for her. Men, you may not be the best leaders and leadership may not even be something that sits very well with you. 
However, authority, the authority that is delegated to you in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit enables you to fulfill and to meet the responsibility given to you by God. The way that we, refill, we fulfill that responsibility is in love, just like Christ loved the church. The love of God is a self-giving, sacrificial love. Jesus is our example and he laid aside all of the privileges of deity you know, he, to, to come to earth. He, he took on a human body and he, he died for our sins. Husbands, are you laying down your life for your wives? Let me put that in the singular. Husband, are you laying down your life for your wife? Are you putting her needs above your own? Have you laid aside your desires and aspirations to support and love her? There is an equally problematic uh, situation that also can arise within marriage. And it's very much fed for, by our culture and the spirit of the age in which we live. And that is one of passivity and capitulation. I would say in the church that apathy leading to passivity, which then leads to paralysis and finally to capitulation, is uh, something that, that we have has a far greater effect on marriages, the family and the church. And it's far more prevalent, yes, in women, but especially in men. In our culture, we have a crisis of function and identity amongst men in general and We've allowed that to flow into the church. Society lacks fathers and it lacks role models, but we, remember, are able to reverse that in Christ Jesus. The, the Spirit enables us. Men, we have to rise up in the, the life-changing, culture-breaking power of the Holy Spirit to love and to lead our wives and our families to support their physical, emotional and also their spiritual needs. In doing that, we will reflect the glory of, of our loving and mighty God. For he alone is worthy and he alone deserves all the glory. Remember, we don't do that in our own strength. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. When we follow the statutes and the ordinances of God, and that really just means following his acts, his edicts, his decrees, following God's commands, God's directions, his prescriptions, the way that God wants us to do things. As we read that in scripture and then we begin to do those things, blessing will flow in our lives. We find ourselves in the, the will of God when we do that and he enables us to do his will. He always enables us to do his will. You know, this morning you may find yourself being challenged by some of this. Maybe you're a wife, maybe you're a husband, uh, maybe it doesn't particularly apply to you in, in those contexts. But you may be struggling with that. You know, as a wife, you may be having trouble allowing your husband to actually take that authority and fulfill the responsibility that he needs to fulfill. Maybe it is that you're trying to bridle or manipulate or to turn that head. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps it's more an issue of uh, passivity and, and not actually contributing. You know, I, I'm just reminded actually of Sarah, who in the scripture is sort of advocated really as a model wife. She obeyed and submitted to Abraham in everything. He made mistakes. I mean, it could have cost both of them their lives actually. You know, lying to Pharaoh, the, 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 the head of Egypt, is probably not a very wise idea. Uh, but he made mistakes, but still she submitted to him in that. But yet when the time came, she actually spoke up and she, she spoke into his life. So it wasn't just a, ho a submissive thing completely. There was also a contribution that happened as well. She spoke and, and, and in fact God said, you should listen to Sarah. Listen to your wife concerning what she has to say about you, you know, the, slave born, uh, wife, sorry, the slave wife and also her son. 
So there, there are things there that, that we need to have in all balance. And, and again, as men, you know, we, we may be struggling in those different areas to stand and to take the responsibility. It's not something that is strong in our culture to do that. Family male role models are not seen in the way that we have seen them perhaps at other times within our culture. Not necessarily saying that they are always good, but in Christ Jesus we can set that good and right example. And we can actually help our families to help our wives and to bring about the blessing that God desires. So if you relate to any of that this morning, or perhaps you know it's something that you are looking to you know, as a young person to, to, to get married, uh, perhaps that's something that you desire and aspire to at some stage, then you know, I want to come and I want to pray with you this morning. Let's come and do that. Father, I just want to ask in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus that you would really come and speak to all those that would hear this message today. Lord, wherever it is that they may be, whenever it is that they hear it, Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would speak the things that you are desiring to do. Lord, I pray for all of the church that, Lord God, that we would be able to grasp a hold of this word and apply it so that, Lord God, you may be glorified. I particularly want to pray, Lord, for the, for the men and the women in New Gen City Church. Father, would you help us to follow the prescription that you put down in Scripture so that we might see the blessing that you desire for us in our lives. Lord, you want us to reign in life. And part of that is for us to be following exactly what you are putting down and, follow, and, and laying out for us within the Scripture. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you come and you empower us to be able to live the life that you want for us. Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon husbands, upon wives, upon young people that are perhaps looking to get married this morning, upon those, oh Lord God, that are looking to follow and to walk in your ways, Lord, and in your will. May your blessing be upon the family in a broad sense in our, of, of our families individ, individually, but also on us as a family of, of belie local believers, the Lord God. Lord, we just submit to you and we ask that you would move in and through our lives, that you may be glorified, that we reflect you in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Well, it's been great to be able to share that with you this morning. I pray that you would have a really blessed week and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Hopefully, we're going to see each other face to face very soon. Blessings upon you in Jesus' mighty name.